made the joke figuratively, allow me to make it literally. I can't get four sports writers to agree on anything, and Marion Rivera got 425 to. Also, we have the Serena Shocker, another collapse. Let's go around the horn. That we agree on. That's a collapse. Yeah. You are the first person, and then that reaction. So awesome. It's fascinating to me, though, because the idea of unanimous. You're either a Hall of Famer or you're not. If, you're, if you are, unanimous shouldn't be that far out of reach. It's also ridiculous that it's you people who decide this based on your ideas of greatness, morals, and mean looks you got over the years. But the prevailing opinion was if Ruth, Gehrig, Williams, and Mays were unanimous, no one would be. That was thought for generations, and now Frank Isola, one of your beloved New York Yankees, is the first unanimous. Mariana Rivera, how does that sit with you? You know, I think for a lot of the old-time baseball players, they probably don't like it because, like you said, you look at Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, most recently Ken Griffey Jr., and sure, those guys should have been unanimous. That doesn't mean that Mariano, though, shouldn't have been unanimous as well. What I also like about it, it's a reliever because there's so many debates over the years. Well, you know, 20, 30 years ago, a reliever pitched two, three innings, and here's Mariano just coming in to get those final three outs, as we know, are the three most important, important outs of the game. He deserved it. There should be other guys that are unanimous as well. Bob Ryan? I believe he's the right person because he will carry this honor with great dignity and we're all happy for him as a person. Yep. But I don't think he was the right player to become the first person to become unanimous, as Frank alluded to. There have been a minimum, and I mean a minimum of 50 people, maybe as many as 75, and we would have time, I'd love to name them, who you, you could not look me in the eye and say, that guy is in a Hall of Famer. There have been at least 50 people about whom it should have been in before him. And also, unlike Frank, I am uncomfortable that it is a reliever, that it is a closer. Uh, that is getting this honor because I don't think, yeah, that makes me, I, I was, when I went up to this, I was not happy to think he's going to be the guy. If anybody's going to happen it soon, it's going to be Mario. Thank Rivera. you for your honesty, and, Bob Rod. I mean, this is interesting to me. First, but I, I, I preferred it was going to be somebody other than the closer because the closing position is actually quite uh, shady and debatable. Shady and debatable. All working. right. Tim Kalashaw, do you want to address that first? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm with Bob on that. Not that Rivera didn't deserve it or anything like that, but. Uh, the guy he, you know, the Rivera beat and saves Trevor Hoffman. It took him for a few years just to get in. How can this guy now be the first unanimous yeah. player? Three years ago, Ken Griffey Jr. was three votes short. Uh, that would have been at least a nice place to start. But, but at least it's finally over with now, and we don't have to deal with this about it never having happened. I've always just wanted to go back in time and ask those, those, that first group of writers, what was it about Babe Ruth's game you didn't like? <laughs> yeah, uh, we're, we're all in agreement team. there. You know, what did he do dogs. wrong yeah. to yeah. not make the Hall of Fame? But KB, now yeah. you've heard it from Tim and you heard it from Bob Ryan, that a reliever is not like every other player in baseball. Maybe a reliever shouldn't have been the first unanimous. To that, you say what? Well, maybe not, but he was. And you know what? He, came, he has come to define that particular role, which is incredibly important in baseball. I mean, we've just talked about it in the playoffs recently, how important the play, uh, uh, relievers have become and closers in, in particular. And here's a guy who did it for so long and so well with basically one pitch, that cutter, which makes it even more amazing. And so now you have a unanimous uh, person into the Hall of Fame, and maybe this will clean it up going forward. Forward. Maybe next year Derek Jeter will be a unanimous pick for Hall of Fame, which seemed to me to make perfect sense. This is music sense to Frank forward. Isola's ears. Frank, you have the last word on Bob and, and Tim saying maybe a reliever shouldn't have been the first unanimous. Well, shame on Tim for having the nerve to put Trevor Hoffman in the same yeah. sentence. <laughs> Mariano Rivera, he should be happy he he's in the same Hall of Fame. But, but you know what? Why are we blaming the players? It's the sports writers that have done this. Ken Griffey should have been unanimous. He's the most recent guy that should have been unanimous. Tom Seaver, Willie Mays. I mean, to now be upset that Mariano Rivera is the first one, now there should be more. KB, you I'm, brought I'm up, okay with Mariano you brought up Rivera's postseason career, KB. More humans have walked on the moon than have scored on Mariano Rivera in the postseason. And we'll let that be <laughs> the last go. word in this discussion. Let's, let's talk more, broader. Edgar Martinez, the DH generation, is now getting into the Hall of Fame. And Roy Halladay and Mike Mussina. Those two pitchers getting in over Kurt Schilling. Bob Ryan, you're in Boston. Kurt Schilling had a huge 
part of his career in Boston. Some of the most, I mean, recognizable moments in the history of the game. And Schilling is not being enshrined this year. How does that sit with you? Uh, it always aggravates me. I vote for him every year. There are only two. Re there's two ways to look at it. That's why someone wouldn't vote for him. One is that you honestly don't think his credentials are good enough. And two, you are a problem. You have a problem with his politics. I truly hope no one is voting against him by that reason. But I've, I'm guessing at least one person out there is. That's wrong. The other one, I don't get it. I don't know how people can't see he's the, he's a, he is an absolute no-brainer for me. Kurt Schilling should be in the Hall of Fame. Tim Kalisha. I'm with Bob, I, and I can't imagine that there aren't some voters. I, I really don't think there's that many, but there's got to be a few that are not voting for him because of the stances he's taken and, and, you know, things he's said and done since his playing career was over, which has nothing to do with whether or not he was a Hall of Fame pitcher. And, and I can't get past that, that postseason 11-2 and record, a whip below one, just all the great games, not just for Boston. Got Arizona mm -hmm. a World Series over that Yankee team that everybody uh, thought was so unbeatable in the World okay. Series. So uh, Schilling should be in there now with these guys having moved on, his chances next year. But I let think, me ask you to this way, increased. Tim. Uh, you had one start. Is it going to be Halliday? Is it going to be Messina? Or is it going to be Schilling? It's not going to be Messina. Uh, he's third out of that group for me. It's going to be between Schilling and Holiday. And if it's a postseason, give me Kurt okay, Schilling. B, how about you? You know what? I'd take Halliday. I mean, those Cy Youngs, uh, perfect game. Um, his performances in uh, the postseason as well, uh, awfully strong. Um, and, and you look at the wins overall and you know, how he dominated uh, his, uh, his generation uh, as, as a pitcher. Uh, but I think everyone here has touched on something. You know, much of this is really less of a referendum on the players themselves yeah. than it is the media and how we judge people and decide to put is. them in. And that's what really needs to get correct. Right, okay. So then to answer the question that was raised by both Bob and Tim, do you believe Schilling's politics is keeping him out of the Hall of Fame? Uh, I, I'm sure there's some people that... that feel that way. Um, but you know what? I also think that sooner or later, um, and sooner more than later, he's going to get in because more more people are changing in terms of the, the pool of uh, uh, ballots out there, and analytics are becoming so much more part Same of Same question to you, Frank Isola. Do you believe Schilling's post-career is factoring whether he gets into the Hall of Fame or not? I think we'd be naive yeah. to think that there aren't some voters that aren't factoring that in. I would say this. In defense of Mike Mussina, 270 wins, that's 54 more than Kurt Schilling. But in my book, when I think Hall of Fame between the two of them, I think of Kurt Schilling. 4-1 and one in the World Series. He was outstanding in the postseason with Philadelphia, also with Boston, the bloody sock game, with Arizona, beating the Yankees. Kurt Schilling is a Hall of Fame pitcher. And you mentioned those guys. Who do I want in a big start? I'm taking Kurt Schilling. And, and, and I think you've all agreed that the post-career should not factor into his, his regular career. But, Bob, you said it yourself when you were bringing up Marion Rivera. What type of person he is, an exemplary person, you've called him off air as well. Yeah. Well, if that's factoring in just a little bit in the back of your head with Rivera, then for some voters, it could factor in with someone like Clemens or Bonds. Let's look at the full ballot one last time. Clemens and Bonds finally creeping up north to 59%. They were 57 and 56 last year, so it's not a big jump this year. But do you see it as a tide turning or as a tide, you know, and time specifically running out, Tim Kalashaw? I think it's getting closer. For the first time, I think they have a real chance because you look at next year. Jeter's the only new guy coming in who's going to get in. and then you look, So you'll look at, well, who got the most votes the previous year? And it's going to be Schilling, Clemens, and Bonds. And again, as, as the voting rolls kind of move on, I, I think this is an older voter, younger voter issue. Uh, and, and I think three more years, I think they have a real chance to get to KB? 75. Yeah, I, I think they're going to get in, and to Tim's point, you go a year beyond that, and you're talking about Torrey Hunter, Tim Hudson, Burley. So once again, you're not going to have a, a, a fire, you know, a star fire class of people, and so I think they can get I in. So. I think they will get in. Prior to the steroid era, here are two guys that were dominant in their, you know, pitcher, outfielder. To me, when I look at Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens, I think they're Hall of Famers. I do not, however, think they're That's getting That's the whole point. You don't think they're getting That's the whole point of this for me, though. If you just take their career and cut it in half, they're both more Hall of Fame ready than the guys really that were just elected now, with the exception of Rivera. Uh, Bob Ryan, where are you on, on what you're seeing, the trend there in voting at least? They're edging closer, but unlike the Rolling Stones, time is not on their side. I don't think that three years is enough to make it up. The You're going to have a Hall of Fame with Harold Baines in it, no disrespect, before you have Barry Bonds in it.
Well, you already have one with before you have Barry Bonds in, but without Barry Bonds in, I, I don't know how that's even possible. We'll move on. Serena out at the Australian Open. This was a shocking collapse. Or a great comeback by Pliskova. It was 5-1 in the third for Serena. It was a foot fault. It was an ankle roll. And now it's the second major loss for Serena in a row with last year's U.S. Open debacle thrown in there, everything that was. And it looked like it was going to be a typical Serena steamroll again. Tim, how do you view Serena going out like this? Uh, this was probably a bigger surprise <clears throat> even than last year. Pliskova's... Pliskova is a very good player. She's been number one in the world, and she's beaten Serena once before in a Grand Slam on a, on a hard court. But Serena dominated the second set, was up 5-1, serving, uh, you know, having shots, having four match points, and couldn't win any of them. And when that happened, I, I think the air just went out of her, and, and Pliskova, Pliskova was the one who steamrolled her the rest of the way. What are you seeing with Serena that's different now than it was years ago when she would just steamroll through? Well, I mean, I think she was hurt. I think that's number one. I still don't think she's quite as fit, even though it's 10 months past um, that difficult pregnancy uh, and delivery that she had. Uh, and I also think she's somewhat haunted by the U.S. Open and how that, that finished up. Because I look at that, and she had the foot fault, and she didn't uh, react uh, when, you know, maybe a year ago she would have reacted. Um, and uh, you just look at the way she was in this, entered this uh, tournament, you know, just the other day or last week she was praised for consoling a crying opponent who she had defeated, and this time there was a lot of equanimity in everything, in the way that she behaved and the things that she So, said. not to put words in your mouth, but, but she's lacking a kill switch that she used to have? Is, is that what you're seeing, Kevin? I did not see that kill switch yesterday, and I think part of that was because it was short-circuited by that Frank, how about you? Well, you know, you mentioned the footfall, Tony. After that footfall, she lost 25 of the last 33 points of the match, including all 11 on her serve. For Serena Williams to be up 5-1 in a Grand Slam with a chance to go to the semifinals, and for her to lose that and to blow four match points, that is as shocking of a loss in any sport, male or female. Bob Ryan. The only thing more surprising than her losing up 5-1 serving for the match is if she were 5 love serving for the match. I'm stunned. And yeah. if she weren't hurt, that's amazing. I got to believe the injury was a fact. I read the analysis from Pam Shriver. She was wondering about her court coverage. And, of course, this is, this is totally understandable coming back from um, near death, honestly, in, in her delivery and, and, and delivering birth as well. Her court coverage is not there, and that really lowers the, the margin of error for her a little bit. We're going to take a break right here. Buy or sell on the other side. Stick around. Play. Back to Around the Horn, coming to you from the Heineken River Deck at Pier 17. Buy or sell time with Ice and Stone in the lead. The Shaw, Mr. Bob Ryan, some work to do. Here's buy or sell one. John Gruden at the Senior Bowl, really talking up Kyler Murray and talking up whether size matters for quarterbacks anymore. They come in all shapes and sizes nowadays. Says it used to matter a lot, now it doesn't matter so much. Tim? Do you believe Kyler Murray is an object of his affection? Do you believe he can go for Murray? And what does he do with Derek Carr? Uh, I, I think they definitely could. Those three picks, you know, the Cowboys and Bears picks turned out to be pretty low, but they also have the fourth pick. And I think Murray will go somewhere in the top ten. Teams are going to fall in love with him. It's becoming more like the college game. And they save a lot of money if they cut Derek Carr. So you think that's a possibility? This is about Kyler Murray here. Kevin Blackstone, you think the Raiders could go for Kyler Murray? Absolutely. Well, for one thing, we know that Gruden's been divorcing himself from uh, David Carr ever since training camp. Derek and, Carr. You know, with this guy, Derek Carr, and, and you know, with this guy out there looking as great as he does, uh, Murray, you got to go for him. You got all those draft picks. You got to get a quarterback. Go for the best one. Yeah, they have three of the first 36 picks, and you mentioned Carr. If they release him by June 1st, they save $15 million. I thought it was interesting that Gruden mentioned the names Drew Brees and also Russell Wilson. Murray, a little bit smaller than that's what would concern me. Five, if he's 5'9", I don't know, can you win a Super Bowl with a 5'9 quarterback? John Gruden says size doesn't matter as much as it used to or at all anymore. Uh, Bob, do you agree with that? Well, number one, let's measure him first. Then we'll see if all the professionals are still talking the same way. Yeah. But 
anyway, I think that, yes, they, I can see him doing this if he falls in love with, with Murray. And the, and the model would be Wilson, I think, more than Breeze. Because of the mobility factor, the run-pass option thing, I think that's where he fits into the modern the game. The point is, he said it doesn't matter as much anymore. They come in all shapes and sizes. They always came in those shapes and sizes. And if you're learning look, more, look who's in the Super Bowl. May, maybe that whole QB uh, quarterback camp that he ran, maybe everything he was saying there wasn't right. We'll move on. Buy or sell, too. Your jurisdiction, Tim Tallis. Show Cole Beasley tweets. The front office pushes who they want to get the ball to. I haven't been in a huge priority in that regard, so maybe more balls come my way in the two-minute drill where nothing is planned. JB, buy or sell? I got to sell this. I mean, I don't know what he's talking about. First of all, they got a guy named Cooper there now who's a pretty good wide receiver, so that's going to take some pitches and catches <laughs> away from you anyway. And why are you going after the front office? It's the coaching staff. Right, guys, solo. I, I agree with Kevin. You, know, you get the, you know, the combination of that diva position in the NFL, wide receiver, and social media. Those are things you say maybe to your family members, your agent, in private to the coaches. I don't know if you go on social media and let everybody know So now know diva receiver applies to slot receiver. I don't think I've thought about that one before. How about you, Bob Ryan? <laughs> I think the, the guy uh, maybe knows something that we don't know, at least something I don't know. Now, we've got a resident cardiologist over there who will be able to enlighten us. But I think there may be something to this. I mean, we know that that team operates differently than everybody. And now team. we turn to that cowboyologist, uh, as, as you said, Bob. Tim, you hear him say the front office is making the call here. Well, that means Jerry. That means Stephen Jones. What do, you, what do you think of that? That's why I've got to stand firmly on the fence on this one, Tony. I sell his <laughs> complaint because he caught 65 passes. That's a lot for a slot receiver. I buy what he said regarding where the power is in this organization and the fact that the head coach doesn't always seem to be calling the shots. All right. We'll move on. Buy or sell three. Duke beat Pitt last night. And Zion, Zion, as he is wont to do, and Jay-Z was there. Took it all in. Jay-Z, founder of Rock Nation. Frank Isola, you think this trip was business or pleasure? You know what? I think every time Jay-Z show, uh, shows up someplace, it's about business. But I also think Zion Williamson is a guy that people want to see play. So what would you rather do? Go straight from high school to the G League or go play at Duke where every game's on TV and you got guys like Jay-Z coming to watch it? Bob Ryan? Oh, I think that uh, this is a perk of being a celebrity. You can go waltz into Cameron Indoor Stadium, get his first row seat, and enjoy yourself watching a basketball game about the most discussed basketball player next to maybe James Harden in the world right now. So that's all. Period. He's enjoying Tim Callishaw, you're our resident Jay Zologist. Please go ahead. Prime example of the fact that Jay Z is not a businessman. He's a business man. Yes, and he's we, we know it. There he you go, Tim. Always thinking in those terms. It's definitely about the business. KB. Yeah, this is definitely about the business. I mean, if he was a big fan, he would have been to the UVA Duke game, you know, or he may be following me down to go see UNC when they play at Cameron uh, in a few weeks. Oh, so, wow. Oh, I had no idea. Well, wow. that's oh. the game. That's, that's it. Man. Man. All right, you know how you said it was business, nothing personal? This is absolutely personal right now, Tim Kalashaw. <laughs> that's right. Give him What happened? You're going the wrong way. You're out. Tom Hagen. Uh, Frank Isola, Bob Ryan, showdown next. Frank Isola, Bob Ryan, showdown, best of luck, gentlemen. Showdown one, Booker versus Jang last night. Here's what started it. Is that a whiff or a glancing blow? And here's how it ended, both running through the vomitorium to meet up and maybe finish business? Booker physically was held back. Nobody was holding Jang back. Where do you stand on taking it to the tunnel, Frank? Uh, players always talk about this. Jang said after the game they were going to go back there and exchange jerseys. By the way, the gentleman holding back Booker, that's Max. He was Amari Stoudemire security guard, came to New York, then went back to Phoenix. Don't let the looks fool you. He's a okay. teddy bear. That All right. Guy. That was, Sweet that was guy. a lot of information. And how about you, Bob? Uh, we know it's a lot of bluster and it's a lot of hokum. It's a lot of rhetoric. But I'll tell you what, if it ever well, came said. real, I would take the guy from London over the guy from Moss Point, Mississippi. And you would. You, you, th you think he's a little bit more of a brawler, huh? Oh, okay. Interesting. That bloke. Well, I'm glad you gave a shout-out to your friend, Frank, but it's not getting you a point on this show. There we go. Bob Ryan. Showdown two around the horn to force overtime on the ice last night. Pavelski throws it at the net. They score! And around the he buzzer to beat team. Buffalo on the court last night. What court? That court. Double team. Looking for help. That's an incredible right look with no time left. And also around the buzzer to stay number five, Michigan had a win as well. Uh, which buzzer beater did it for you, Bob, Ryan? 
Well, the basketball one in Michigan was interesting because it showed the random nature of the block shot. And it, even though they got the block yeah, shot, they still yeah. lost the game on the shot. But hockey is so rare. A buzzer beater, literally, in hockey is the rarest thing maybe in all of our pro team sports. It, it laps the field. Therefore, I got to go with the hockey. Yeah, it happens very rarely. I would say the Caps as well. But what is Northern Illinois doing with that court? It looks like your TV <laughs> is messed up. It's like watching Boise State play football with that stupid mm -hmm, blue uh -huh. field. That was terrible. How do we even know that it went in? By then I was rubbing my well, eyes. People have been saying about us for the 16 years we've been on TV. It looks like our TV is <laughs> messed up. What are these guys yelling about sports for? Bob Ryan, take the FaceTime. <laughs> My solution for this Hall of Fame PED crisis, take the pressure off the writers, put it back on the hall, it's their hall. Put a plaque outside the hall where the plaques are and, and say as follows, there was a period of time when PEDs infested baseball. We do not know, however, which juice pitchers pitch to which juice batters. We are told our writers to vote on the basis of achievement only. And then, however it was obtained, you, the fan, have every right to feel however you feel about the people you see in there. You might even want to give the famous finger to one of the plaques. But the fact is that they're going in on the numbers, and then don't worry about it, how they got there. And then I will vote for them all. I'll pick one up. There, there you go. I mean, but so why stop with PED? I mean, Half the Hall of Fame is from a segregated Lily White era. Let, let's throw it all out there and say, you know, throughout the history, there have been some I ups and downs. And, and well, look at it as a museum. Something. We'll see you tomorrow.